Okay, let's uh, take our seats and we will get started. That includes all the men in the back. That includes Elder Miller and Pastor Bauer. Not that I'm calling out men and women. I know. Okay, let's find our seats. I know, it's, it's tough. <clears throat> we continue our study in the, in the covenants, covenant theology. And this morning we're looking together at the covenant of works, which is foundational to our understanding of the world and to the gospel. Very important. So let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we praise you as the maker of all things. We thank you that in providence you govern all of your creatures, ordering all of our actions to your own glory. And as the Redeemer through Jesus Christ, you have saved us for yourself. And we thank you that you've bound yourself by the covenants that you've made. And we pray that as we consider these covenants, we rejoice in your fidelity and your wisdom and your goodness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At the end, I'll pray for the church plants. I'm sorry, Ray. <laughs> I always forget that. It's terrible. Okay, so the covenant of works. I do want to look at the um, chart, the diagram, briefly. I did make a slight change. You'll notice, well, you can't see it, I guess, in here, but the Mosaic covenant that what used to be yellow is now green and yellow. And when we get there, you'll understand why I did that, but it's, it's chalked full of grace, and it's part of the covenant of grace. So I don't want us to think that because it was yellow that it had no bearing in the covenant of grace, okay? So this, that old Mosaic covenant, I don't know if you can see it, read it, that's striped. It's yellow and green, so it shares the essence with the greens underneath it, but it is distinct. It's a unique covenant. So we'll look at that when we get there. But the covenant of works. Our confession says this, the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. So this is the covenant that God made with mankind through its representative, Adam. He was the federal head, as we'll see. He, God dealt with mankind as a whole through its representative, which is very important. And so what this does, in part, is acknowledge the covenant character of history. All of history is characterized by covenant. God deals with mankind by means of covenant, the solemn commitment with divine sanctioning. And it's a covenantal history, both pre-fall and post-fall. So the experience of Adam in the garden was covenantal, and the experience of mankind post-fall is covenantal. The Westminster Catechisms calls this covenant the covenant of life. There are various names for it. The Westminster Confession calls it the covenant of works, as we just saw. Some call it the covenant of creation, like my old professor, Meredith Klein, it's the covenant of creation. Other theologians, older ones, call it the legal covenant. All of these phrases are accurate. They've been used theologically. And any one of them is okay, just as long as you know they're all referring to the same thing. Now, evidence for this covenant of works is found in the original command from God to man. And you remember what this is. It's in Genesis 2. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. And there's his goodness and his bounty. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So there we have the express statement of a stipulation in the covenant. Yes, ma'am. You can't hear me? Okay. Yeah. I'm thankful I'm not one of those. 
although my gimp probably betrays me. <laughs> Can you hear me now, Mary Alice? Yes. Okay. So, is it too loud? <laughs> Old people. So this is the first, the first express indication that we have of the covenant. However, as we'll see, there is other evidence for it. Now, the promise of life in this covenant of works can be inferred from what the Apostle Paul says regarding the old covenant. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. So what he's indicating there is that the commandments that God gave, eight out of ten of which are prohibitions, right? Thou shalt not have any gods before me and so forth. But the prohibition implies the promise of life. The threat of death implies the promise of life. So we have here in the original covenant of works this idea that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. If you don't, you shall surely live. That's the promise. So in this covenant, God promised life upon personal and perfect obedience, and he threatened death upon disobedience. That's the covenant of works. And the reason they call it the covenant of works is because it depended upon the obedience or the disobedience of Adam. Any questions at this point? Very foundational. Another, I would go so far as to say, if you deny the covenant of works, you are likely to deny the gospel. I won't say you'll deny the gospel because John Murray denied this and he was very orthodox. But I think he was able to hold it consistently. I don't know how he did it, but he did. Now, some theologians deny that there was a covenant of works and for various reasons. Pelagians and Socinians deny the reality of the covenant because they're rationalists. They think it's unreasonable. It doesn't make any sense. God deals with mankind as individuals. Arminians deny this covenant because they refuse to acknowledge Adam's federal representation. And doesn't that make sense? If it's all up to you, if your salvation depends on you, well, then it doesn't depend on the disobedience of Adam. He disobeyed. You and I, by nature, are children of wrath. They would deny that because we come into this world, according to the Arminian, with the ability to choose Christ. We would say, because of Adam's sin, we have no ability whatsoever. We just choose sin. Uh, fallen man drinks iniquity like water. That's our natural bent. You cannot choose good if you're outside of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 says, this, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Now, why would he describe Christ as the last Adam? Well, because both of them are representing a certain constituency. Adam is the representative of mankind. Christ is the last Adam representing the church, the elect, all those who are saved. So he uses these two representatives to symbolize all of humanity. Some deny this covenant because they will not acknowledge any works principle. In other words, it is inconsistent and inconceivable to think that God would give life to Adam for his obedience. The blessing so far outstrips the condition that it couldn't possibly be so. Does that make sense? Am I being clear? The reward is so great that he couldn't possibly have offered that for obedience. Don? Yeah, you just said if you're outside of Christ, you cannot choose good. Right. Uh, people choose good. Yeah. Well, that's the point. Right. Yeah, this is, this is a really good question. Uh, people choose good. They seem to. Our neighbors who don't believe in Christ, it seems like they choose good. They help the old ladies across the street, and they'll give us meals if we're in the hospital, those kinds of things. So you're right. Objectively, they can choose things that are objectively good, but they don't spring from a heart that loves Christ or that wants to glorify God. So that's, that's the issue. It's Objectively good, subjectively evil, okay. right? Yeah. So the only reason they would help the old lady across the street is because it's some selfish reason. They might feel good about themselves. 
Oh, I helped the old lady across the street. I really, I'm, a, I'm a great guy. You know, it's selfish, selfishly motivated. It's not for the glory of God. It cannot be for the glory of God because those who work evil hate the light, as we'll see. And this is our doctrine of original sin and total depravity. So these theologians think that God's goodness is incompatible with the notion of any type of meritorious works. We're unprofitable servants. You come in from the field as a servant. I'm not going to invite you to sit down. You're going to get dressed. You're going to serve me. And as you've done all that you're required to do, you've just done what your duty is. And it can't possibly be the case that God would offer to Adam the gift of eternal life and confirmed holiness on his obedience. So they would deny the covenant of works, as we see right there. In their minds, therefore, the covenant relationship must everywhere be an expression of pure grace. So the covenant that God made with Adam is of grace. It's so gracious that God would see fit to form this promise with Adam. It's grace. It's so gracious that God would save us in Christ. It's grace. It's all grace. The problem with that is that if you deny the principle of works, then you deny that Jesus Christ earned our salvation. Because he came as the last Adam to fulfill the requirements of the law, to satisfy the demands of justice, and he earned our salvation. In that sense, our salvation is based on works, right? <clears throat> works for him, faith for us. The principle of works serves as the foundation for the whole notion of grace, as I just said. Christ performed one act of righteousness to secure eternal life for the elect, Romans 5. Paul makes it clear in that fifth chapter of Romans that it's only because Christ obeyed that you and I can be saved. Others deny this covenant because they find no expression of covenant in Genesis 1 or 2. Wait a minute. If it's a covenant of works, why doesn't the Bible call it a covenant in those first two chapters? Because it's not mentioned. And as we'll see, there's evidence to suggest that it is a covenant, and our confession says that we should derive the truth from Scripture by good and necessary consequence. There are things that are expressly stated in Scripture. There are other things that are derived, inferred from Scripture. That's an important principle. The Trinity is probably the classic example. You will not find the word Trinity in the Bible, but it's the foundation of our faith. We infer that there's three persons, one God from Scripture. How do I infer that? Well, the baptismal formula is one. You baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Equal plane, all three. Divine persons, one God. Any questions on some of these objections? Any comments? Jonathan? I remember from our Hosea. Yeah. Well, that's, that's another one. That's Jeremiah, yeah. But Hosea says, the, like Adam, they've transgressed the covenant. Yeah. And Hosea 6, 7, yeah. So if you're not like, looking for that, you might read over it, but then you realize that's actually a more, a more explicit reference. Yeah, and some will get around that. They'll say the word in Hebrew, Adam, can also refer to man. So they'll say, well, like man... They've transgressed the covenant. Well, after the fall, all men transgressed the covenant. So there you go. It's not referring to Adam, but I think it does refer to Adam. It doesn't make much sense just to refer generically to man. All right? Okay, so the substance of the covenant is present in Genesis, even though the word is missing. We find two parties. Remember, a covenant has two parties, God and man. There are covenant stipulations, as we found in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Eat of every tree, but don't eat of that tree. When you eat of it, you'll die. There's a stipulation. There's the penalty, death, and the implied covenant promise. You obey, you'll live. So the substance of a covenant is there. And if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. In this case, a covenant. Elsewhere, we find other unnamed covenants that most will identify as covenants. For example... The word covenant doesn't appear in Genesis 12, Abrahamic covenant. But I think every theologian will admit that this is a covenant. 
The word covenant does not appear in 2 Samuel 7. However, God made a promise to David, and every theologian admits that this is a covenant. The substance of a covenant is there. You have said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant. There we have the psalm, psalmist reflecting upon 2 Samuel 7 and calling it a covenant. So as Jonathan said, there is later revelation that looks back and identifies but in the actual forming or establishing or cutting of the covenant itself, that word's not there. We have prophetic reflection that describes it as a covenant. Hosea 6, 7, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. So he's talking about Israel there, and he's likening Israel's disobedience to the disobedience of our father, Adam. The creation commands or what can be called fiat. You've ever heard of that word fiat? It's when a sovereign just declares, makes a decree. That's a divine fiat. The creation commands or fiats by which the whole creation appeared were covenant oaths. Now this is fascinating. This is what Jonathan was getting at. Thus says the Lord, if you break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, so on and so forth, Jeremiah is calling what God said at the beginning, covenant fiats. Let there be light. That's a covenant fiat. It has the nature of a covenant. God promises that there will be light. He promises that he'll sustain the light and that this light will nurture life on earth. It's an authoritative decree made by a sovereign authority who is able to fulfill and enforce it. And when Almighty God speaks, his divine word is as certain and inviolable as the oath fulfilled. We've talked about this before. That's the only reason that the Bible can talk about the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Well, wait a minute. He was slain in time. What are you talking about before the foundation of the world? Well, because God's word is as good as done. He's ever faithful. And if you have God's word, you have, in essence, the substance. Isn't that what Hebrews 11 is getting at? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if you take God's promise, it's as good as having what you will enjoy when you have it by sight. I have salvation. I can have joy that nobody can take away because his promise stands sure. That's why we say that when God Almighty speaks, his divine word is as certain and inviolable as an oath fulfilled. The promise made to David, it's interpreted as swearing an oath. So we have here this idea that in Genesis, when God said, let there be light, that was as good as saying, I covenant with this creation that I will sustain it. And when God said to man, well, as we'll see when God created man, it was a covenantal act. Any questions at this point? <clears throat> I know some of this is technical, but it's important. Rob? Uh, is there any need for a, um, covenant to go to something like this? Uh, the, the question is, is there a reason why so many people are against it? Well, I mean, the easy answer is sin. <laughs> you know, um, I think, no, I think John Murray is a hero, and he's a very able theologian, and why he would deny it. I think part of the reason is that he doesn't see the word covenant in the original chapters, and he doesn't want to stray from the text. He, he's so bound by Scripture, which is a good thing, that I think he didn't want to put there what wasn't revealed. Now, what's interesting is he wrote a book on the imputation of Adam's sin, which deals with Adam's guilt and corruption being imputed to us, which has to do with the covenant. So how he could get the imputation of Adam's sin right and deny the covenant of works is beyond me. It's baffling. But I think there is a good example of somebody who approaches Scripture so faithfully that he just couldn't see it. Alex? commonly referred to as replacement theology. They think that uh, it may 
it's God a liar that he's breaking his promises to the nation of Israel because they interpret all of those promises as that's for that people group and the church is not Israel. And so they think it makes God a liar. Hmm. So they so that's what I hear covenant theology referred to as replacement theology. Hmm. Replacement theology, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I can understand why they would say that. I don't agree with them at all. It doesn't make much sense, and it certainly doesn't make sense in Romans 5, where he compares Adam and Christ, these two representatives, by the one man's disobedience, the many die. By the one man's obedience, the many are made alive. One man as a representative, that has to be covenantal. But yeah, that's a good, good addition, Alex. Anybody else? Okay. Well, as we found out, these creation fiats, these decrees, <clears throat> were covenantal decrees made by God, and they're covenantal in nature. And so implicit in those fiats, let there be light, let there be a firmament between the heaven and the earth, so forth, he's committed to preserving and maintaining the created order. When he makes a covenant with the day and the night, he's going to maintain it as long as history remains. So man cannot destroy this world, even if he wants to, unless God permits it. <clears throat> I know the nuclear threat is terrible, <clears throat> but I'm not concerned that the world is going to be destroyed by a nuclear threat unless God is done maintaining the day and the night and the seasons and the years and so forth. My covenant with the day and my covenant with the night. So the creation of man, this is all leading to this, in God's image was a covenant act. Let us make man in our own image. There is a divine fiat. He decrees we're going to make man. And if his decree is a covenantal act, which we've determined it is, he is creating man as a covenantal being. You are in covenant with God whether you like it or not. Imaging, image of God, is inherently obligatory. Because you're created and I'm created in the image of God, we're obliged to reflect, resemble, obey our maker. Okay? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So the, in I hope I'm not getting too technical. The indicative is you are the image of God. The imperative is be like God, right? The indicative, being in his image, leads to the imperative, be like your image. Be like the one you image. So being an Im in the image of God is necessarily and inherently obligatory. It was not as if God created man and then only afterwards entered into a covenant. Man was created as a covenantal being who was from creation in covenant with the Most High God. So you and I are either in covenant with God under the covenant of works, which means you're cursed, or you're in covenant with God under the covenant of grace, which means you're blessed. What a wonderful thing that is. We're obligated to be like God. We're obligated to imitate and resemble him on earth. And as I said, the indicative had the force of an imperative. God's image, imago Dei. God's imitator, imitatio Dei. Let me just stop and see if there's any questions on that. It's kind of technical, but I think it is, again, important. This is the foundation of the gospel. We need to understand the covenant of works if we're going to really understand the gospel. Everybody okay? Okay. Oh, Ernie? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's part of it. Yes, sir. Destroying the image of God, taking away life, yep. usurping the authority of God, who alone has the power and the authority to kill. Now, he does delegate that to the magistrate in public justice. He does delegate that to the nations for lawful war. And he does delegate that to us for necessary defense. So in those areas, we can take life because he's delegated that to us. But in any other instance, like you're saying, it is a horrible crime. Horrible. So the law of God was written on man's heart. There is his duty, and he was given power to fulfill it. There is his ability in the original created order. 
We are to structure our time according to the way God structured his work. In other words, man was to keep the Sabbath from the very beginning. And it was a sign, a symbol of entering into his rest. The Sabbath was a sign of the covenant and commemorated the creative acts of God. From the very beginning, man in his image was a covenantal being in covenant with his maker, obligated to resemble and reflect his maker, to obey his maker's will, and to bring glory to his maker's name. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Let's talk about the Sabbath. On the seventh day, God rested from his work at the completion of the universe. And what that indicates is that he had this divine satisfaction. What he had made was very good. And he had this um, complacency in his creation. He loved it. He said it was good. And it was not a rest of inactivity as if God was tired and he had to sort of lay down. Jesus expressly says that his father is working until now. It was a royal resting on the seventh day, the enthronement of the sovereign over his creation. You know, Isaiah has this vision of the ancient of days sitting upon his throne and his robe fills the temple creation. This is the theater for his glory. And here we find him on the seventh day being enthroned among his creatures. And it's not as if he wasn't king before. It's just that all the angelic beings and his creation man acknowledged his lordship in the Sabbath. At each phase of the work, he openly declared his divine approval and concluded the whole thing with very good I'm satisfied with what I've done. And the king's majestic glory was on display in the palace that he constructed. As I said, the train of his robe filled the temple. And so the theme of the seventh day is the absolute lordship of almighty God, the creator of all things. You know, in Revelation 4, John sees this open door in heaven and there's a throne sitting there. And then he says, there's one seated upon the throne and his appearance is like Jasper and Carnelian. And it's this idea that the creator is enthroned and nobody can question his authority. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There's no question that this God is the one who was there in the beginning and he'll be there at the end. He has no beginning and no end. He's enthroned. And so the Sabbath, in part, is to glorify the majesty of our king. Which is one of the reasons why Satan, with his instruments, works very hard to destroy the Sabbath. You get rid of the Sabbath, and you can bring in all kind of irreligion, impiety. Happens throughout history. I haven't done a study on this, and I would suspect somebody probably has, but if you look throughout history and you find out when the Sabbath started to decrease, you'll find that impiety began to increase. Inverse relationship. Sabbath keeping is a visible, believing, obedient confession of Yahweh as Lord. It's a blessing to the creature, of course. It's for our good. Jesus even said the Sabbath is for the good of man, but it confesses him as Lord. One of your most precious commodities is your time, right? What do you do with your time? And you take one day out of seven and you confess him as Lord. I don't do my own pleasure. I don't do what I want to do. I worship and I serve my king. And as we've said many times, as you get in your car with your family and you back out of the driveway and take off and your neighbors see you going, it's an implicit confession that he's my Lord I'm going to his house. I'm going to worship with his people. I'm going to acknowledge him as my king. And so by this means, we submit to his authority. We celebrate his reign and affirm our allegiance to him. And this is what Adam was to do as a covenantal being. He's in covenant with this sovereign. And as his sovereign, part of his obligation was to honor him with his time, with his treasure, with his talents, Of course, the Sabbath also anticipated the completion of man's work 
and is entering God's rest. So God gave this as a means of blessing, and it anticipated if man was obedient and he completed his work, he would enter that rest of God, reign with him in confirmed holiness. That was a wonderful sign. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, says the author. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. So you see, even after the fall, the Sabbath sign points forward to this entering God's rest in Christ, who was enthroned when he ascended on high. So the Sabbath looks back and commemorates creation, looks forward and commemorates the new creation. It's a wonderful sign. And if man had resisted the devil, if he had passed his probation, if he had fulfilled his work, he would have entered God's rest. Any questions? Rob? Oh, no, Mary Ellis? Yeah. Because only in him can we cease from our work because he's done everything. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So Christ now, because of his resurrection from the dead on the first day, that was so momentous that even the Sabbath day could be changed from the seventh to the first. And we commemorate not only the creation, but now the new creation in Christ, who is the enthroned king. And so as we observe the Sabbath now as Christians, the Christian Sabbath, we glorify the majesty of our king, and we confess openly and visibly our allegiance to him. One more comment. The apostle says in his letter that some men esteem one day rather than another. Mm-hmm. Right, he's talking there, I think in Romans 14, when he says one day, <clears throat> one man esteems all days alike, another man esteems one day above the rest. He's talking about the Jewish calendar and how this is a, me, a, a matter of adiaphora, indifference. You want to celebrate Christmas? Go ahead. Make sure that you're convinced in your own mind that it brings glory to God and it's good for you. Because if you can't celebrate Christmas, for example, in good faith, then it's of no worth whatsoever and can even possibly be sin. Whatever you do without faith is sin, right? So if you want to celebrate Christmas, if you want to observe the, the um, what's it called? The Jew, not the Jewish calendar. What do they call the, the oh, I'm sorry? The calendar, the, 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 the liturgical calendar. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you want to observe the liturgical calendar, like my friend Joe Boisel, the pastor of the um, Anglican Church in town, fine, go ahead, do it. <clears throat> don't judge me because I don't do it, and I won't judge you because you do do it, but make sure you're convinced that it's a good thing. But he's not talking about the Sabbath. He'll mention Sabbaths there, or I think in Colossians 2, because of the Jewish calendar. You know, they have all kinds of seasons and festivals and Sabbaths days of rest that were associated with the feasts. We don't have to observe those. But the Sabbath, from the beginning of time, has been an obligation, a covenantal obligation for Adam and his posterity as covenantal beings. It's, it's part and parcel of the covenant. Yeah, so good question, Mary Alice, but he's not addressing the Sabbath there. Anybody else? Rob? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> God, in his original creation, worked and then rested which is what man was to do. He was to work, obey, and fulfill the world, and rest, God's rest. Since that didn't happen, 
Christ, the second Adam, came. <clears throat> he worked and rested so that now we rest in Christ and we can serve him in our work. Yeah. So the new creation is kind of reversed. The work is completed and then we serve, you know, the work of salvation. So yeah, great question. Okay. Probation. God implanted in man's heart this noble aspiration of entering into his divine rest. He's put eternity in the heart of man. And part of that is this desire to enter into God's noble, majestic rest, a rest of blessing. Like his creator in whose glorious image he was created, he was to move from work to rest, as Rob was just indicating. This was implicit in the Imago Dei, image of God. And it guaranteed confirmed glory and everlasting life. Adam, if you obey, if you pass your probation, you will be confirmed in glory so that you will not and cannot sin. Which is what Christ has secured for us, right? We'll be glorified. We cannot, we will not sin. And so God tested man's faith and loyalty by a probation so that he could advance to glory. Okay, you're in Eden. Here's the covenant. We're in covenant with one another. Here's the stipulation. And there's got to be a point in time where I decide you've passed. You've passed your probationary period. So Adam was given an opportunity in the Garden of Eden to make that advance and enter God's rest. If, man were to rest if God were to restrict man to merely continuing in his original state, it's just going to be indefinite. We're never going to know if you're confirmed or not. That would have been a curse because he has this aspiration to be confirmed, to rest God's rest, to be done with the work. So to merely continue in paradise as Adam was in the Garden of Eden would have been a curse. He would have been frustrated in his aspiration to enter God's rest, which is what I said. So the probationary period was instituted <laughs> with time limits. It couldn't last forever. It's like us, if we have a test, you want to know if you've passed. You got to take the test. When's the grading period over? And it wasn't meant to jeopardize man's blessedness, but this probation period with time limits was to allow for his confirmation to glory. Okay, Adam, here you go. Here's the test. Let's do it. And you can be confirmed. Had he successfully passed, he would have filled the earth with godly seed Hudson would have been a lot more beautiful than it is, and he would have been confirmed in holiness. As God's vicegerent confirmed in holiness, Adam would have established the kingdom on earth. He would have filled the world with one great family, no state necessary, no government needed, and he would have subdued and developed it to perfection. Any questions on it so far, the probationary period? Grace? No. Great question. Now, the question is, if Adam had not sinned, wouldn't it have been possible for one of his posterity down the line to have sinned? And the question is, or the answer is no. Because Adam and his posterity, remember, he's a representative. The whole posterity would have been confirmed. It's just like now, Christ is a representative. His whole church is confirmed. Right now, you as a Christian are in a better position than Adam in his pristine condition ever was. He could lose it. You can't. And so Christ has secured for you salvation. You will be glorified. And you will come to the point where you will never sin. And Adam's posterity would never have sinned if he had been confirmed. Yeah. The whole earth would have been filled with the glory of God as the oceans cover the earth, right? So, I mean, it's speculative. It's hypothetical because he didn't pass. But that would have been the thing. He would have filled the earth. Completed his task. Mary Alice? I just want to say, for all of us here, that is the best news there is. It is good news. It's really good news. It's a gospel, yes. 
So the covenant of works was characterized by this principle of representation. Federal headship comes from the Latin word, I believe, that means covenant, covenant headship. Melissa? Yeah. Yeah, is that the reason why Eden was blocked after they sinned? Adam and Eve were exiled, as you said, and they were, the cherubim were stationed at the entrance to Eden with the flaming swords. And so the only way back into the presence of God, paradise, would be to go through the flaming swords and to open up the way again. So it's interesting, on the cross, you know, Jesus turns to the thief and says, today you'll be in paradise with me. Well, the only way that he could be in paradise is if somebody goes through the flaming sword, which is what Jesus was doing, right? And Adam couldn't have stayed there because if he had stayed in the garden and taken of the tree of life, it would have been a, a blasph blasphemous act of desecrating the sacramental tree of life. Yeah, so... We can thank God that Jesus endured those flaming swords for us. And he opened up a new and living way by his flesh, right? Hebrews. So man, mankind would undergo the probation, not as individuals, but as a corporate whole. Adam would serve as the covenant representative of the whole human race. Sin came into the world through one man. Not two, not a hundred, one man. Death through sin. And so death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned? Why wouldn't he say because Adam sinned? He just got done saying that through one man, death entered the world. But then he says, why does death spread? Because all sinned. Well, how did we all sin? We weren't even there. Well, because in Adam, we sinned. You're not only corrupt when you're born, you're guilty. <laughs> That's hard to conceive of. But you bear the guilt of your first father when you're born into this world. And the only way to satisfy the demands of justice for that guilt is for the blood of Christ to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, which it does. That's part of the liberty of Christians. Allison? What's the significance of Eve sinning first, but Adam gets the guilt? Because Eve was not the covenant representative. She is as guilty as Adam. But God appointed Adam as the representative, and so he gets the rap. He was standing there looking at his wife, and she went ahead and did it. Why did he let her do it? He abdicated his authority, right? So he's to blame anyway. Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. One trespass led to the condemnation for all men. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. There you have the representative principle. So we, he tested mankind corporately. This gets at Grace's question. If many offspring had arrived before the outcome, it would have complicated the whole process. So if God deals with man individually, every single one, hundreds, thousands, millions of people, and every single one is tested, it would have been so complicated. Now God can do it. But each person in coming into the world is tested as Adam was tested. And this is what the Arminians and the Pelagians believe. You've got a clean slate when you're born. The problem is you just follow the example of your father and your mother. No, God dealt with mankind as a corporate whole. <clears throat> Some think this is inconsistent with God's goodness and contrary to his justice, but the very fact that he established it, that's enough for me. If in his infinite wisdom he felt like representation was a good way to deal with us, fine. I don't see anybody arguing that Christ represents us for salvation. Wow, that's kind of good, good news. If Adam had passed, he would have been secure. He had every advantage. And there we see the first Adam had every advantage. The second Adam came under every disadvantage. The first Adam was in the garden, beautiful, everything he needed for food. The second Adam came into the wilderness, tempted by the devil, and he fasted for 40 days. Weak, hungry, alone, the second Adam had no advantage. And yet he passed the probation in the, gar in the wilderness. And so the principle of representation is at work in the covenant of grace, and for that we can give thanks. Any questions on that part? Calvin? Do you think that a proper understanding of the covenant of works necessarily leads to a proper understanding of soteriology? I do. 
I do. A proper understanding of the covenant of works leads to a correct understanding of soteriology. Yes, I do. Because it helps us understand <clears throat> that God didn't just say, you know what, you're kind of a nice guy. I'm just going to give you these blessings. No. Christ endured and obeyed so that you could have the right to these blessings. And that's why you can come to God in prayer and say, you know what, Lord? Your son died. He shed his blood. And you tell me that if I confess my sins, that blood will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. It's your right, which is staggering. He makes a wretch like me his treasure. But he does. It's incredible. So to understand the covenant of works is to understand that Christ came to fulfill what the first Adam failed to fulfill. Yeah. Oh, Alex? Oh, go ahead, Sorry, Calvin. I'm sure that <clears throat> I'm sure there are some who somehow disconnect the two, yeah. you know. <clears throat> I would say this is not just Presbyterian, it's it's biblical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> without, hopefully without arrogance just to say it's yeah. biblical. <laughs> Alex You make me feel good. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And you said how there's Christians who believe that we're born neutral, like without a without a sin nature. Pelagian, yeah. It's like I've got a three year old who I did not teach how to sin. And if that were the case, what would God do with her sin? I mean, I know. Right. Without having a sin right. You don't have to teach him the word no. <clears throat> Will you please stop doing that? No. <laughs> they learn that pretty early, right? <laughs> Year and a half. I don't know. Jonathan? Yeah, just throw enough money and education at them, and they should be able to climb out of their pit, right? And the liberals have tried to do that for generations, and it's never worked. And the problem is, is that mankind, by nature, is under the covenant of works, and he's a sinful being. Yeah, I, I'm, I may. So teriology is the study of salvation. Yeah, yeah. So. <clears throat> And so, real quick, this last one. To bring the probation to a head, <clears throat> sorry, God intensified the probationary test by introducing two features. First, he gave a specific command not to eat of the tree. Only one tree was outlawed, while every other tree was available for man's use and pleasure. And among all the other commands, which were positive, enjoy the trees, enjoy life, love your marriage, so on and so forth, this was the only prohibition in the Garden of Eden. And so here Adam came face to face with the absolute lordship of Yahweh. He was reminded by this prohibition that he's only a steward. You're a steward under God's lordship. And man's final destiny was set before Adam. The stakes were high. But then secondly, he ordained a satanic assault in which man would be tempted to disobey his command. This would bring the probation to a head. This is going to test his obedience. The devil denied God's absolute right to command his creatures according to his sovereign good pleasure. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Is he so stingy as to restrict you from all these trees? You will surely not die. So he questions his generosity. He denies his integrity, and the woman fell for it. Satan questioned his authority, his veracity, and his love. And now man had to choose between two masters. Which one is he going to choose? The man sided with the devil. Thankfully, in Genesis 3.15, God came and put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the devil. 
He introduced the whole concept of regeneration. You're not going to win. My original purpose is not going to be thwarted. I will change the heart by the power of regeneration, and they'll love me and hate you. Any questions? I'm sorry this last one was kind of fast, but I'm, I'm over time. Ray has an announcement. Thank you, Ray. It's a wonderful thing to support the APS. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that in Christ Jesus, we have been delivered from the curse of the covenant of works and brought into the blessing of the covenant of grace. We thank you for the last Adam, for our representative who now sits at your right hand, even interceding for us. Please prepare us for worship. There's a grand opportunity to ascribe worth to our Savior and our King, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.